My name is Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast. Today, in the Chinese Literature Podcast, we are going to go to an unexpected spot. Unexpected because you might not associate this place with Chinese literature, but it's a reminder to keep in mind. Chinese literature is always a global phenomenon. Follow me for a minute. Imagine you're in Victoria, British Columbia, the southernmost city and capital of that lovely, I'll just say this, loveliest province in all of Canada. If you drive north from Victoria on Highway 17, the road drops you into Schwartz Bay. From Schwartz Bay, you can take a ferry to the mainland, landing at Tuawasan, near Vancouver. If you were to get onto that ferry as you head out of port, there are going to be several islands on your right. About a mile outside of port, you will pass the tip of the largest of these islands. That is, Coal Island. Surprisingly, Coal Island is the site where 19 poems by the Qing reformer Kang Yo Wei were composed. I know I'm going to have to answer a question y'all are likely having. Who is Kang Yo Wei? Kang Yo Wei. Rob and I did a podcast on him way back in August 2017. We we discussed Kang Yo Wei and his Da Tong Shu, or Book of Great Unity. Kang Yo Wei is one of the most important figures in the late Qing. He was a big deal. In 1895, he was going to take the imperial exams in Beijing, traveling by boat from his home in Guangzhou. This is during the middle of the 1894-1895 war between Qing China and Meiji Japan, sometimes referred to as the First Sino-Japanese War. His boat was boarded by Japanese troops, and he and his friend Liang Liang Qichao were roughed up a bit. Liang Qichao, we're not going to discuss him today, but needless to say, super important in Chinese history and Chinese literature as well. Then... Kang Yo Wei and his friend, and actually also his student, Liang Qichao, get to Beijing, and they hear that the Japanese have won the war, and that the Qing government is going to fold and give the Japanese most of what they wanted in their demands. He and Kang Yo Wei, Liang Qichao, and 603 other scholars, they're in Beijing to take the imperial exams. This is the cream of the crop of China's future bureaucrats. To have gotten to be in this group, you are in the big leagues. Traditionally, these are the people who would run China for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years. Kong lands in Beijing, and he leads the 604 other scholars to write a document protesting the Qing government giving into the Meiji demands. They wrote a document that's about 18,000 zi long, zi being just a, a Chinese character, Bureaucrats in the Qing government resisted change, and they tried to block the protest letter from getting to the emperor. But this document, this one document, turned Kang Yo Wei from just a a teacher uh, with some weird ideas about Confucius down in Guangzhou into a celebrity, one of the biggest celebrities in all of China. After this, his life was never the same. He became the head of an intellectual movement in China to try and reform the Qing government. In 1898, his star shone brightly. This was when he was personally invited by Emperor Guangxu to head up a new government. This was the the reform that was going to change everything. This was the Chinese equivalent to the Meiji reforms, which had happened several decades earlier. They were going to save the Qing. They believed that the Qing was rapidly drifting into obsolescence, and they had a plan to take care of it. They had radical plans to turn China into a constitutional democracy. From June to September of 1898, Kang Yo Wei and his merry band of reformers began implementing this program to change China. China. But they were blocked by Empress Dowager Cixi. On September 21st, 1898, she shut it all down. She imprisoned Emperor Guangxu in the Forbidden City. She took over the government and she began executing many of the reformers who had tried to change China. Kang Yo Wei's brother was executed. Kang Yo Wei himself just barely escaped. He fled via Hong Kong to Japan and then to Victoria, Canada. And it was here in Victoria, Canada, where he founded one of the most important societies in Chinese history, the Bao Huang Hui, the Protect the Emperor Society. They had a branch at first in Victoria and in, and in Vancouver. For much of that summer, he hung out 
at a retreat on Coal Island. He did not call it Coal Island. Rather, he called it Literature Island, something like that. Wen Dao was the name that, that he used to refer to it. But in English, for, for whatever reason, it's called Coal, Coal Island. I Honestly, I, I like Literature Island. Not, not to tell my Canadian friends what to do, but calling it Literature Island might be a good, uh, good rebranding. Now, on Coal Island, he collected his thoughts and he wrote uh, some of the beginnings of a program that was going to essentially be the, the purpose of the Protect the Emperor Society. He, he began to found similar societies, not just in Victoria and Vancouver, but he, he started founding these societies all across the globe. And when I say all across the globe, I mean all across the globe. He traveled ceaselessly in the following years. Before the Qing collapsed in 1911-1912, he traveled to more than 30 countries, going from Canada to India to Singapore to Germany and back again. In 1903-1904, he traveled to 11 different European countries. In 1904, he came back to Coal Island, and he wrote that journey up. That book, he came up with a very inventive title, Records of a Journey Through 11 European Countries, Ojo Shrigo Yoji. This was a travel narrative that talked about what was going on in different European governments at the time, highly influential in China, despite the fact that Kang Youwei is in exile and he would probably get killed if he went back to China. Lots of people are reading this book. Ten years after he became famous, he's still just as famous. For a lot of Qing readers, this travel narrative that he wrote on Coal Island, this was their introduction to what was going on in Europe, to what the West looked like. That was in the summer of 1904. But the poem that I want to read for y'all today was written in the summer of 1899. Imagine, Kang Youwei is there on this tiny island outside of Victoria. One of Kang Youwei's political supporters, Wei IV, that's Wei Se, owned the entire island at the time. He was farming on the island. He allows Kang Youwei to set up a rural retreat on the island. It's called Liao Tian Shi, that's Hut Far From Heaven. This is my translation of what I think was Kang's Chinese. The English language sources that I have have all messed up translations, but I think that these are the correct Chinese characters. One thing to keep in mind about this name, so it's got the word Tian in it. Tian is heaven. Heaven can oftentimes be a metaphor for the emperor. So in Chinese, we say Tian Gao Huang Di Yuan. Heaven is high, the emperor is far away. It's a phrase that compares the emperor and heaven to each other. And in traditional China, going back to the Zhou dynasty, the emperor is understood as a figure, as the, the kind of interface between heaven and earth. So in naming his hut this, he's trying to make some sort of imperial claim, or he's trying to make some sort of connection back home to the emperor, to the Qing emperor in China. Kang Youwei finds him both himself and Qing China in trouble. So what does he do? He writes 19 poems from Coal Island. So that's Wen Dao Zai Yong Shi Jiu Shou. The chanting of 19 random poems from Coal Island. That's my translation of the title of the series of 19 poems. What does he have to say? Here are two of the poems. Far across the seas, we celebrate your majesty's birthday. The dragon banner unfurls above the white men's buildings. White people clinking their glasses assemble grandly beside us, while the yellow race squeeze with lighted lanterns through narrow lanes. The Lord on high grants you life and has pity on us here below. A petty official prostrate in tears lies in bitter obscurity. From this distant Canadian island, I gaze towards Beijing, waves around the emperor's palace prison. How often I return in my dream. So this is not my translation. That's from Jonathan Spence's The Gate of Heavenly Peace, an excellent work of, of history. Let's look at this poem real fast. Here, Kang Youwei is celebrating the birthday of the Guangxu Emperor. Of course, this is not a happy birthday for him. This is the emperor that Empress Dowager Cixi has imprisoned. So Kang is here stranded on Coal Island. He's in exile. He is amongst all these white people, as he says. I'm not specifically sure 
what settings he's referring to when he talks about the the white folks and the yellow folks. Obviously, this is a discussion of racial disparities that existed for many, if not all, Chinese folks in North America. My understanding from an acquaintance who was actually born in Vancouver's Chinatown is that the Chinese were forced onto the land that's called today Chinatown because the land is not good. It's at the lower end. It's, it's a little to the east of the old old downtown Vancouver, and it was land that was more prone to flooding. I imagine that Kang Yo Wei is alluding to the poverty of Vancouver's Chinatown and Victoria's Chinatown, and, and just the, the general way the buildings are squeezed together, the way folks are, are very poor. I'm not sure if he's being more specific than that, but that's, that's my reading of this poem. He's surrounded by white folks. His Chinese compatriots are there in Canada, they're economically much worse off than the native-born white Canadians that they, that surround them. The dragon banner that he refers to in line two of this poem, that's the Qing Dynasty flag. The Qing Dynasty adopted uh, an official flag as a part of their encounter with the West. It may be one of the most awesome flags ever created. The 1889 version has a dragon on a yellow background chasing a flaming red sun or a red pearl or something like that. Kang Yo Wei hangs this flag outside the building where he's setting up the Protect the Emperor Society. In this poem, there's an interesting parallelism going on. As I think I've mentioned on the podcast several times, one of the things that defines Chinese poetry is the importance of parallels. If in English poetry, rhyming is the prototypical means for organizing a poem, in Chinese, it's parallelism. It's the sort of prototypical thing that drives poetry. It's how Chinese poets judge other poets. They look at how good the parallels that they draw are. So if you look at lines three and lines four and lines five and line six, there's an interesting parallel. And I'll, I'll, put Jonathan Spence's translation of this poem onto the podcast website. There's an interesting parallel in lines three and four and lines five and six. Line three talks about white people having a good time, clinking their glasses. Line four talks about how troubled the Chinese folks in British Columbia are. Line five talks about how there is this powerful emperor. Line six talks about Kang Yo Wei off here in Canadian obscurity crying. There is the suggestion that the emperor is a parallel for these powerful white folks. And Kang Yo Wei is equated with the Chinese Lao Bai Xing, or the, the common folks struggling over here in these tiny lanes in Vancouver or Victoria or wherever it is he's referring to. So at first, when I read this poem, I thought that it was sympathetic to the emperor's plight. But upon looking at this parallel, I'm kind of wondering... Is Kang Yo Wei suggesting that the Qing elite and the emperor himself has lost touch with the roots connecting them with their people? Does this mean that Kang Yo Wei himself is somehow more Chinese or, or closer to the people than the Qing elite who are running the country? That doesn't really make sense to me because Kang was all the way to the end a supporter of the Qing empire. But you have to remember the Qing were Manchurians. They were not Han Chinese. And there's a lot of nationalism swirling amongst Chinese folks who are talking about how do we fix the country. A lot of them are saying, we need to get rid of the Manchus. We need to make China Chinese again. In the end, I don't know what this specific parallelism means, but I found it interesting and I thought I should point it out. What I find so touching about this poem is those last two lines. He looks across the ocean from Coal Island to Beijing, and he admits that he frequently returns to the Forbidden City in his dreams. Now, what I wonder is, is this the Forbidden City that Kang Yo Wei was invited to in 1898 when he helped try to reform the government? Or is it the Forbidden City of today in 1899 when the emperor is imprisoned by his aunt, the Empress Dowager Cixi. I know I've banged on a long time today, but I just want to finish with this partial poem from the same cycle of poems. I've been able to find the Chinese version of this, but it's written in this very <laughs> difficult to read cursive script, and I have not actually been able to do the translation myself, so I'm just going to trust this translation. A drifting stranger, 2,000 li away, long white sideburns of 40 years time, turning to look at the Milky Way and enjoying the bright moonlight, most r rare on Wendao, that is Coal Island, to chat with fellow villagers, ashamed to shock the neighbors with the troubles and disasters of our party, ashamed at having accomplished nothing for our fellow countrymen, afraid this may be a separation forever from my native place. 
So that's it for today. Kang Yo Wei is a part of this fascinating history, not only of China's late Qing, but also, I would say, a uh, part of Canadian history that, that I don't think gets discussed and talked about enough. Too often, we miss the fact that not everything that's important to Chinese history happened in China. Sometimes important Chinese events happen outside of China. They happen in Canada. They happen in the U.S., in Europe. Those places have roles to play in Chinese history, particularly as homes for important revolutionaries. It's also a reminder that though we think of ourselves as different nations and, and different peoples, we are all connected. That is to allude to another famous poem, No Man is an Island, Even If He's Living on Coal Island. I'm referring to John Donne. His poem is quite popular in Chinese. I'm going to end this podcast of Kang Yo Wei's poems written on Coal Island and their connection both to Canadian and Chinese history with the Chinese translation of that famous John Donne poem, Mayo Ren Shi Zhou Dao. That is, No Man is an Island. I'm Lee Moore, and this is the Chinese Literature Podcast.